We, we have a couple of attendees and we can see uh, everybody's joining um, uh, pretty rapidly. So I'll just bear with us. We'll give it another one, two minutes, then we can begin. Thank you very much. All right, we'll begin in about 30 seconds. So um, welcome everybody to another of uh, Jura's webinars. Um, but we have um, a Jura stay alive as part of our stay alive campaign so what is stay alive so basically this is a b2b initiative that uh, Ajur uh, began a couple of weeks ago uh, basically related to the whole covid pandemic in terms of how do we discuss ways that uh, we can work together as businesses to help us help each other stay alive and share ideas across uh, the nation across countries across the world in terms of what are the best ways uh, what are the best practices in how we can stay alive? Why is that? Because none of us has been a pandemic before. And therefore it's out of this kind of sharing that we can learn how businesses are attempting to stay alive and also are succeeding and can be able to thrive during these challenging times. So today we are with us Maurizio and Andretta and I would like to, I'll hand over to, to Ken, to Kenfield, who is the CEO of Adure to be able to basically men, you know, uh, highlight a couple of items, but also do introduce um, uh, Maurizio and Andrit as well. So over to you, uh, Ken, thank you. Thanks, Gilbert. Um, hello, everyone. The name is Ken Field Griffith, CEO of Ajua. Um, really exciting time to have um, Ajua at, um, on this session today with um, Andretta and Maurizio. So Stay Alive is pretty much a campaign, as, as Gilbert mentioned, to really get us together, to really talk about the key issues of thriving in this time and actually coming out of um, COVID together. And today we have TLCOM, TLCOM, two partners of TLCOM, we have Andretta and Maurizio. And Andretta, both of, both of them are Stanford, not MIT, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would, I would uh, blame you for that. But yeah, but um, Andretta and Maurizio, they're um, TLCOM, TL Capital, TL, TLCOM Capital in BC um, in Africa and focus on technology and technology enabled um, companies across the continent. You probably heard of the investment in Della, Twigger Foods, um, also just recently Okra and also Kobo 360 and um, Jua. They've been great board members as well and really driving us also to make decisions during this time where things are uncertain. And I, you know, as, as board members and the discussions we've had in the boardroom, we thought it was very, very important for them to actually bring this to a wider audience. So we have um, Maritza and Andretta coming from TLCOM, who's, I mean, their background, um, 10, 15 years, um, 20 years actually in investing in Africa and um, has a lot of successes with two exits, one to, back, to, um, to BlackBerry. Um, if, if some of you guys know BlackBerry, BlackBerry is a mobile, mobile technology company. <laughs> Not the iPhones, but BlackBerry. And then also Tactus Group, which is a P, um, private equity firm across um, the continent. So I will hand it over to Maurizio and Andretta to lead the way in discussing some of the things that we need to think about as entrepreneurs, as businesses, and also um, um, capital constrained entities 
we're really trying to make it through this time and thrive after um, COVID. And um, we'll hand it over to Andrea and Maritza to lead us in this, um, this discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Uh, just before Andretta and, uh, and Moise take over, so um, quick note to everybody. Um, so in the Q&A section, which is down there, please, do note your questions there because we will use that to basically read out your questions out to, to our panelists today. Um, so put them out down beforehand. We'll try and put them all together uh, towards the end. So don't lose out your question. Make sure it's all down there. So thank you very much. Over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Ken. It's uh, great to um, have an opportunity to share our thinking and our perspective uh, for this uh, um, unexpected uh, turn of events that we're all going through. What we want to do is really to show you a few slides, like four or five, just to frame the issues and try and stimulate a conversation uh, because this, as Ken said very, very wisely, it is a time where we need to exchange notes and uh, try to uh, help each other take the best possible decisions. So I'll share my screen uh, with the presentation that we have uh, just to, again, set the stage uh, for this. Uh, we have uh, um, really three things we'd like to talk about. The first one is to uh, just tell you who we are to make sure you understand where we're coming from and what we do. Uh, the second is what is the nature of the Africa technology opportunity that we're pursuing. And the best way to do this is through sharing our portfolio. And then most importantly, we have three slides, one for each of the three um, entities that we think uh, are a relevant way to frame the conversation. One is how do we as a venture capital fund are impacted by COVID? How tech startups uh, can uh, uh, survive and actually succeed in this environment and also what does it mean on established businesses um, so let's start from who we are and uh, this is just uh, a recap of our team and our investment strategy uh, it's a team of four partners you have myself and Andreata today um, in uh, um, in this call and uh, we're both uh, privileged to have been working with Ken and the team for um, a couple of years now uh, we have Ido, uh, he's an uh, Israeli engineer and entrepreneur who uh, launched a, a tech company in Africa and then joined us. And then we have Omobola Johnson that some of you may know, uh, she's in Lagos and she was the um, uh, telecom minister in uh, Nigeria. Before that, she was heading um, uh, Accenture in Nigeria for many years. The, and the reason we start with the team is because this uh, a venture capital fund, like every other company, is built on the ability of the different people to bring different perspectives and to try and take the best possible decision. We have been around for uh, more than two years, uh, and we think that our job description is not financing, but is business building, to be at the service of the entrepreneur. If you think about the life of a relationship between a venture capital fund and a company, it's usually about five to 10 years. And in those times, uh, there's very few financing decisions and there's very few checks that are written, maybe three, four, five. The rest of the time is about trying to be at the service of entrepreneur and helping her or him to build the business. We are in Africa. Uh, we're in Nairobi, Andrea and myself. I'm now uh, doing my lockdown period in Palo Alto, but my house is in Nairobi and I can't wait to get back. Uh, uh, Andreata is in uh, uh, Nairobi, um, Omobola is in Lagos, and Ido is in London. And there's a reason for that, the story travels a lot uh, into Africa, is because at this point in time, we don't have all the ingredients for world-class venture capital in Africa. We still have to make sure that we provide entrepreneurs access to what is not uh, necessarily available in terms of capital, co-investors, talent, in terms of uh, opportunities for uh, more financing rounds uh, and so on and so forth. We have, uh, after a few different funds that we're focusing on Europe and Israel, um, managing now a $71 million fund that is dedicated to Africa. And as um, uh, McCann was mentioning, we have had a few exits um, out of African entrepreneurs. Um, and yes, we confess that three out of four people uh, here are from Stanford, but 
you know, we like to work with people from MIT and other schools. Um, <laughs> our, our philosophy of investing is the fact that this is a radical and not an incremental endeavor. So we define it as nonlinear value generation, which means that we try to work with entrepreneurs that leverage technology to attack large African challenges. And uh, this is one of the three elements. We look at markets, we look at companies, we look at the investment. So is the market an attractive one? It means that it must be a large challenge. It means that um, it's something that technology can change or reinvent. Uh, it means that it grows fast. It means that it can be valued at the end of the road uh, with high multiples. Um, but then, you know, a large opportunity needs an entrepreneur that has an ability to capture it. And uh, this requires the ability to articulate and execute a strategy that wins in that market, the ability to capture that opportunity. And then you can still have a big market and a great company in a great market, but have a bad investment if you don't really align with the entrepreneurs in terms of valuation and in terms of the terms of the investment. So we have these three buckets and we think that returns depend on markets that present large opportunities, a company and an entrepreneur that has an ability to capture that and investment terms that make sense. And we call that mission driven compass in the sense that entrepreneurs that have an ability to look at terms and valuation as a means to an end, not as a, an objective per se. And so the compass must be on the large pie that we're all creating uh, over the next several years. Uh, as I said, the entrepreneur is at the center. Uh, don't trust VCs that are on the spotlight. Um, this is, the hero is the entrepreneur. Uh, we are uh, marginal figures that are sitting uh, in the back seat and uh, our uh, role is to pick the right cars to ride on, but not to tell the entrepreneur what to do. We invest between half a million and 10 million uh, in all stages of the venture capital. So uh, let's look at the at our portfolio and R is a portfolio of entrepreneurs, which is why we show faces here and not products. And uh, these are people that are attacking three big opportunities that Africa is showing as far as technology is concerned. The first one is, the fact that technology can accelerate access to large underserved markets. If you think about you know, the penetration of mobile and the penetration of everything else, mobile is just more um, accessible. And that can be a platform through which uh, we can create conditions to um, access pieces of vast markets that are currently underserved and make products and services affordable just because technology allows the cost positions that make things profitable also at very low price point. Uh, we have one company in this space and it's uh, Sim Shagaya with an education company called U Lesson. And Sim is a returning entrepreneur. He was with Conga and uh, with Deal Day. And uh, we're um, happy to note that the um, uh, environment here is starting to create repeat entrepreneurs that create successful companies and then come back with more. There's another uh, category of opportunities, which is the fact that right now, the African consumer is not a very known entity. And so there's a lot of supply side companies that are consumer facing that have no idea about who the customer is, what the pricing should be, how to segment, how to take advantage of the opportunity to differentiate offers. Because the last 20 years of enterprise software have been based on the internet and we all know that Africa is not about internet but about mobile. And so there are some heroes like Ken and his team or Elo at Tarragon in Nigeria that are trying to create mobile platforms through which companies can talk to consumers. Uh, and this is a gigantic opportunity that um, I think the clients of Ajua can appreciate uh, and um, uh, it's becoming a, 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 a mass feature for all the companies that are serving large consumer markets in the African continent. And then there's a third opportunity, which is the fact that many verticals, many industries are broken, are inefficient, uh, have been created by different layers of marginal incremental 
uh, attempts at making them more accessible, more efficient, and have not worked. So there are entrepreneurs that are redesigning these verticals uh, through technology uh, in different places. So you know Twiga, and that's Peter, uh, that they have redesigned the agriculture supply chain. There's so many intermediaries between farmers and, and, and street vendors, and they are trying to cut them all and just uh, uh, share the benefits to the vendors and to the farmers. In logistics, Kobo, uh, it's a complete opaque market between drivers and companies that need to move stuff across the continent, and they're trying to bring transparency. There's software development in Andela. There's a desperate um, uh, shortage of software developers across the world. And uh, nobody has thought that Africa could be a great supplier of smart people that can uh, finalize their ability to be developers and be available to the global markets. And then there's all crying financial markets. We just did this investment that is not a lender, is not um, a bank, but is rather an infrastructure that allows all kinds of fintech companies and banks to have an easier time in connecting with um, with uh, uh, their customers. So this is not a place where there's a lot of new technology. Of course, there's a lot of software being written. There's a lot of smart technology people in Africa, but the real innovation is in the business model, in the ability of entrepreneurs to identify a big problem and use technology to reinvent business models to solve that problem. And that's the risk that we're taking. We're taking the risk of uh, serving a large opportunity with a new business model that is using technology, but not necessarily new technology. So the problem is not that technology will not work. The problem is, is if we price wrong, if we execute, if we go sideways, but uh, the, the big innovation of Africa is African entrepreneurs that understand the problem and find the solution using technology as a means to an end. So we wanted to say, uh, you know, from our uh, perspective, we look at um, a few hundred entrepreneurs per year. Um, what is it that we are learning and we would like to share uh, in terms of the impact of this COVID crisis on venture capital firms, on entrepreneurs, and on the large companies. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain what's happening inside uh, our world. And I will leave uh, Andrea to uh, discuss a few implications on startups and on the large companies. So for us, what, what happens on the venture capital model? There are two main drivers of the return. We are uh, investors that try to help entrepreneurs to build great businesses. So the first driver is the selection of, of, of a portfolio, the selection of which companies we're investing in. And uh, our uh, driver, uh, our North Star, is not really how many companies we lose, but the magnitude of the winners, right? We put together a portfolio of 10, 15 companies uh, that can become very big companies. And the only way to do that is by uh, supporting entrepreneurs that have, have the courage of taking a high level of risk because they believe in a view of the world that can be different from the current view and fundamentally give up everything, remortgage their houses, leave their jobs and put together teams to pursue those opportunities. So we want to make sure that at the time of the investment, we can believe that if everything works, this can be very, very big. And so we put together a portfolio of high risk companies and sure enough, we lose some of them. Uh, but we need to be left with companies that can make 10, 20, 50, 100 times the money we invest. And so the first driver of return is our ability to be disciplined in only supporting companies that can be disruptive enough to generate very high returns. And sometimes along the way, they don't manage to, and that's fine. So it's fine to lose companies because they didn't make the, um, uh, the big target, but it's not okay to finance companies that are not targeting a big target. And the key elements, as I was mentioning before, is you know let's make sure that we go after big markets, that we go after companies that are positioned to capture the upside, and that we manage to align with the entrepreneurs on the main terms of the investments. What is COVID doing to us? 
The first point is because this is a relationship that becomes quite intimate with the entrepreneur, can we actually commit to new investment without meeting the entrepreneur? We just announced an investment last week in Opera. We are about to announce another investment in another company uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. These were relationships that were created before the crisis. So yes, we've negotiated all the terms and we have uh, driven the last part of our investment decision work in remote, but we're asking ourselves, and we don't have an answer, um, can we make new investment? Can we open new relationships without actually sitting down with the entrepreneur, seeing the company, looking at the team? And uh, we're thinking that probably we can do that if we invest with players that have had the opportunity of that relationship. But that is a challenge for us. So when we think about how to expand our portfolio, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we can do to have the confidence of starting a relationship, of committing capital without the interaction, the chemistry of the partnership that can be created with an entrepreneur. The other challenge on this first driver is the resource allocation. How much money in our fund do we want to devote to new investment when we have a number of um, situations in our portfolio that need support? And so it's a constant trade-off between the protection of the existing portfolio and the ability to diversify the risk and add more vectors of high risk, high return uh, to our set. So this is just to say that when we look at selecting the portfolio, we have our own challenges in figuring out how to expand it and how to make sure that by expanding it, we're not taking resources away from the current company. Then, then the other part of our work, which is once we have made an investment, how can we be useful to the value generation journey of the entrepreneur? And the fundamental belief there is that this is not about what can go wrong, right? But this is about taking the right risk. So if everything works, how big can it be? Taking more, always pushing the entrepreneur of taking more of the right risk of what we believe is the is the real nature. And of course, you know, the elements to try and be relevant to the entrepreneur is helping with talent and recruiting, providing capital, of course, being a sounding board for the strategy, but never ever being the people who formulate the strategy. Uh, open doors if we can, and ultimately making sure that the capital markets or a buyer will see in this company more value than has been invested in. So what's the impact on COVID? First of all, the, the relationship must be brutally honest. We need to uh, make sure that there's a proper assessment of the revenue risk of this crisis, and there's a proper ability to conserve cash um, to, to survive the crisis. And this is again about picking the right risk. So the, when I was talking about the mission-driven compass, is the entrepreneur attaching his tool to go through the field to a star, and the star is the con conflict of firing a few people now, or is it the design of driving uh, a company towards, um, towards the crisis and uh, having an ability to design a platform that can rebound? Uh, and this is obviously much easier said than done because uh, all entrepreneurs know that um, even firing a single person is a super painful and shocking experience, um, particularly when the journey is done uh, in, uh, in such intense uh, working environments. Uh, the other is obviously the opportunity to redesign and refocus. The, 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 the world is going digital and uh, a lot of these technology companies are uh, betting on a vision of the world that is digital. So there's an acceleration of that transformation and. Uh, we're trying to support companies to see those opportunities. And then, of course, there's a triage of the portfolio because um, not all the companies will be able to go through this. And again, we have to um, uh, have the ability of picking uh, the companies that um, have the best ability uh, to do that. So this is what we see as the impact of this crisis on our job. And I will now... Uh, uh, pass to Andreata, who will discuss more of the impact that we're seeing on the tech entrepreneurs and on the more established businesses. 
Great, thanks, thanks for that, Maurizio. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, this is Andrietta. Uh, Maurizio, if you can move to the next slide. So the next piece of the presentation will really will be made. I'll discuss how COVID has impacted Africa tech companies, um, and also giving examples from our portfolio just to bring it home. Uh, so fundamentally, you know, I think as we're all aware and reading in the news, the impact is quite um, is quite large. Uh, from many perspectives. Uh, so one from a li finance liquidity perspective, uh, others from operational adjustments that uh, um, companies are having to make. And then also, I think also out of the crisis are emerging some opportunities that companies can, uh, can take, take advantage of. So in terms of liquidity and financial assessments, um, we see on the sources of cash side, uh, so cash squeeze in terms of revenue as well as uh, capital investment capital coming into the into the ecosystem. So revenue, obviously, because of you know there's mass um, lots of unemployment that's happening. Just you know companies drawing back and consumers also drawing back on on consumption. And uh, even when you look at previous uh, pandemics, so if you think about SARS and Zika. Uh, on the capital side, about 30 to 50 percent, uh, there were 30, there was 30 to 50 percent less VC investment during those crises, and it took 12 to 18 months to recover. So, what we're advising our portfolio companies is to make sure you have at least 18, 12 to 18 months of cash uh, in order to be able to survive the crisis and then be able to rebound after the crisis, um, after after the COVID is under control. And then, so that's on the sources of cash, uh, cash. And then now on the uses of cash, um, there's also, you know, really painful decisions that are happening around just deep cost cuts in order to manage your cash. Uh, so this is this goes to renegotiating every cost line and seeing what um, what expenses are necessary right now for the business. So you know, many businesses are retreating back to your core, back to your focus and just really operating on the essentials. Uh, and then this also comes with the decision to having to let go of uh, some staff as well as uh, reduce, uh, reduce uh, salaries. And here also the thinking is around, um, you want to have as much cash now uh, in your reserves versus, so you make some of those difficult decisions now so that you're able to survive the crisis and fight another day, right? Because if you're not able to have enough cash, because the reality is we don't know how long the crisis will last. So the more cash you're able to release now and have available to you, this, this will allow the companies to be able to, uh, to, 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 to rebound and uh, take advantages of the opportunity post the crisis. So within our portfolio, we're seeing in terms of revenue, uh, projections, those are down 20 to 60 percent, uh, as well as, you know, just assumptions around cash collection. In terms of staff reductions, it's 10 to 15 percent, uh, salary reductions in the 20 to 40 percent. So really uh, difficult, um, a difficult time uh, for businesses. Uh, and and uh, I mean, the reality is in Africa, there's no stimulus kept package, right? So you see in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, companies, there are some stimulus packages that are being passed, but that's not the reality for Africa. So businesses need to go internally and figure out how do I streamline my operations so that I have the essentials to be able to survive the crisis and be able to, and then come out and uh, still continue my business. Uh, we're also seeing, so I, I, again, on the liquidity side, you know, companies looking at their working capital and trying to see how do I get cash out of that. So think about your inventory, how to move that quickly, how to hold less, your accounts um, re receivables, so trying to collect as much cash and uh, renegotiate credit terms with your, with your creditors. Also, we're seeing you know, a halting or a limiting delays of expansion plans, whether this was a plan to launch in another city, launch a different product, build a facility, uh, so we're seeing a lot of uh, just a whole, you know, impact on, on expansion plans for, for businesses. 
and um, yeah, fundamentally, this 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 um, the companies that will probably will be able to where to 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 manage the crisis will be those that can make these tough decisions now and uh so you know there's value in in moving decisively and moving fast in making decisions to preserve cash uh and then on the operational side certainly lots of adjustment uh lots of remote work we're having a webinar <laughs> For, for example, you know, so I think busy camp, uh, leaders are, and CEOs are having to deal with how do I manage uh, distributed teams? Uh, how does that impact culture and productivity? And uh, also, you know, if, you, if you're a business that can't work remotely and people still need to show up to work, so heightened security measures, building redundancy in case, uh, you know, a, a staff catches, um, catches uh, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, and we also see within our portfolio, and I think just around the ecosystem that, you know, it's a difficult time also for CEOs to be able to navigate through these uncertain times, having to make very difficult decisions. If you're thinking about, you know, layoff stuff, reductions, like how do you communicate that to staff and how do you give them comfort? How do you calm them in the middle of, uh, in the midst of, uh, of the crisis? And, I th and also what's happening within on the operations side, uh, so many people, as people are getting laid off, uh, I think more from, um, if you're as a company, uh, there is a supply of uh, staff of people within the workforce. Uh, so this could be an opportunity depending on how, on how many resources you have, how much resources you have to be able to get some of the skill set that you've been looking for and perhaps we're not able to. Uh, but I think even just on a long-term basis, companies just need to structure themselves so that they can also win in the labor market as much as they win in the capital market as well as in the product and service that they sell there's a lot there is called generally competition in the labor markets but now could be an opportunity uh, with a surplus of labor to capture some some of the fill some positions that you were meaning to fill but were not able and that are essential for this time and then uh, what we're also seeing is that there are opportunities uh, within uh, that are that are emerging and actually the businesses that have been able to fare better in this crisis are those that are operating digitally and online uh, so so if you think about so companies that are serving businesses or serving consumers so a business like ajua which is uh, helping businesses connect to their customers this is a critical time um, because uh, because you know uh, people and consumers are not showing up to restaurants, they're not showing up to banking halls, but instead, uh, but, but businesses still need to connect with them. So the Ajua platform uh, is a great way to be able to consumer, to connect with consumers. Uh, if you think on the consumer side, uh, education, online education also has, um, has increased. We have a, one investment in your lesson, uh, which has seen a significant jump in demand for their services as schools as closed and parents are looking for you know productive ways to engage um engage their 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 their, their, their children uh, also what's happening within this space is um as opportunities are evolving businesses also need to think more critically about whether this is a short-term change because of covid or this is a fundamental change in your strategy because if it's short term, then you don't want to configure your entire business to this new opportunity. But if it's a fundamental shift, which is what we're seeing, if you think about what's happening in, digit, uh, in the um, increased use of digital payments, online learning, distributed platforms, uh, then as a business, you need to think, how do I now come, how do I reimagine the future for this new normal, uh, which you can leverage quite, uh, quite significantly to grow your business. Uh, so when you th when you think about all that's happening within um, tech companies around liquidity operations and emerging opportunities, the winning entrepreneurs are those that will be able to make tough decisions now. Uh, so be decisive and move with speed. And those that are able to adopt with courage to emerge in business and consumer uh, cultural shifts that's happening uh, because of this pandemic. Because the reality is the pandemic is not taking weeks to resolve. Uh, it's not taking months, to, you know, it's going to take a couple of months, which is enough of an opportunity to create a cultural shift with, in terms of how consumers and businesses operate.
So next I'll move on to how COVID, um, some emerging opportunities for established businesses out of this, um, out of the COVID uh, crisis. So there's a, there's a VC partner uh, from Sequoia Capital who has a quote that really captures um, what the COVID has done, uh, which is that it's catapulted the growth of internet um, into the future. So what it would have taken five years uh, you know, and a lot of marketing uh, to get done in terms of getting people on digital uh, that COVID is doing for us now. Um, of course, you know, the, the acceleration will be much higher in the West than in, in, in Africa, but nonetheless, Africa too has been catapulted a couple of years into the future. So for established businesses, uh, opportunities here are about going digital and, you know, going digital for real in the sense that, so digital in the way you operate uh, as a company and then also the way you engage with your consumer, uh, because um, you know, with restricted movements, with people taking significant precautions about who they engage with, where they go, no business can really operate uh, out the way it used to operate before. So really looking to see how do I leverage technology to be able to to grow my business at this time. Uh, also, there are opportunities to leverage, you know, sectors and infrastructure verticals that have been accelerated. So if you think about e-commerce, digital payments, online education and distributed platforms, and, and um, you know, going online and using digital, uh, digital platforms is, is fairly, is, is good for, for any business because what it does is it increases access. So you suddenly get, access to consumers you didn't have before or the consumers you had lost. Uh, there's lower transaction costs uh, because they are operating online. So even for you, as you envision your business from an operational standpoint, uh, the cost, is, the cost is, um, is lower, the efficiency is higher. And you know, also more importantly, is you're able to get data on your consumers, which can help you in decision making. Uh, so you're not just making decisions in a silo. I think in the context of all of this uh, for established businesses is that, you know, innovation typically doesn't happen in uh, established, established traditional companies. Innovation is happening at startups. It's happening uh, with, with entrepreneurs, with tech entrepreneurs. So I think as an established business here, it's, it's important to think about who in the tech ecosystem around us is already solving these problems and to be able to partner with them uh, either as suppliers and then, you know, if it's an organization that thinks very, very, very strategically as well, you can think about how do I acquire uh, one of these uh, companies to and bring it into in-house uh, and, and, uh, and, and use it to, to accelerate my growth in this period. And then uh, I, I'll just end to, with uh, just the thought that, you know, let's not waste this crisis, whether it's you're a tech entrepreneur, you're a VC, you're an established business, uh, but just use this as an opportunity to adapt to the changes at hand, reinvent ourselves, uh, make sure we, you know, create our businesses so that we live to find another day and be able to thrive once the, once the pandemic is, uh, is behind us. Thank you, and uh, we can move now to, to questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Andrietta and, uh, and Maurizio. Um, and I just want to pick up from what, there's a couple of questions, but just before I get to that, I want to pick up on exactly where you ended, which is do not let this crisis go to waste. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was this joke that if you had an hundred dollars, you can become an oil barrel, right? That you can, you can, you can buy, uh, you know, oil for a dollar barrel each, and, and definitely with a hundred dollars, you can, you can be some. Now, will we ever see the case where oil goes below $10 again ever in our lifetime? Who knows, right? Uh, but there is definitely opportunities. I know that presented, there's definitely opportunities in the current crisis. And therefore, it's quite in tune with what uh, the Stay Alive campaign for uh, with the Jewel is. is about not just about staying alive, but what are the opportunities where you can actually start to thrive as well? So on that note, there's a question um, from Daniel. And uh, what Daniel is asking basically is, uh, Danielle, I think, sorry, uh, is basically, um, I, I'm not sure if this, probably this is either of you, right? So how much of the $71 million tied for 
have you already invested and are you still looking at potential targets despite the current pandemic? So to date, we've invested um, about half, uh, half of, uh, of the 71 million. And uh, so we still have, you know, sufficient uh, resources to invest in at least another five to six, um, five, six investments. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at investments despite the, the pandemic. Of course, you, you look at it with the lens of, can this, is this a company that will be able to, to survive through the, um, through the crisis? But we are looking. I think the, the strength of TLCOM is the fact that we also have local presence. Uh, so myself, I'm in Kenya, or mobilized in Nigeria. So it's, you know, there's a challenge that Mauricio was saying earlier that we need to meet entrepreneurs because we're investing significant amount of money. Uh, so we have you know, several engagements with entrepreneurs in person before investing uh, because economies are starting to open up. We can take meetings locally, probably wearing a mask. Um, so yes, we are, we're still looking to, to invest. Excellent. Great. Um, this question is directly to Maurizio, I believe. Um, you know, what's the basic um, definition of a good investment or valuation term? Yeah, I, I think you know valuation is an art and not a science, and uh, uh, we can uh, very happily share the way we look at it. So when we look at valuations, we tend to ignore the, the what the company is now. So we don't apply multiples of current revenues, profits. Usually, you know, we don't like to invest in companies that make profit. It means that they're not growing enough at this stage. Uh, so we try to work with the entrepreneurs and try to make a picture of what the companies could look like a few years down the road, which is, of course, a fictional exercise. There's a lot of guessing, but it's trying to have a view of what these companies could be in, quote unquote, if everything works. And then we try to say, what's the value of that company, right? Mm -hmm. And then we say, okay, if this company five years from now uh, is worth, uh, you know, could be worth 200 million. And then we want to make at least 10 times the investment. So it means that the value of the company now is 20 million. And how much capital do we need to inject into this company? Say it's 3 million. And then 20 minus 3 is 17, right? These are all fictional numbers, but it's just to say the valuation exercise is a valuation that needs to be anchored in the future and in the upside, in the risk. What is it that can happen that makes this company very valuable? And if that happens, what is the return requirement that needs to create the discipline and the alignment between the investor and the entrepreneur? So we all want to make money. If the entrepreneur doesn't make money, the venture capital doesn't make money. So we need to target a high level of return to compensate for the risk. And that's the driver that brings us back to what the company could be valued now. And so it depends on how much capital you need to inject into the company, you can then get to the value of the company now. That's our general view. So it's not that, you know, series A multiply five times the revenue. This is all, um, yeah. it's, it's not reality. The reality is there's a group of people that is thinking about capturing a large market. And when they succeed, how much is the value of that success? And then we go back to today, and that's the valuation of the company. The platform that allows a sufficient return to get to a good place in the future. That's, that's really awesome, Maurice, you know, in moving from the theoretical valuation to what's really practical as well on the ground, right? So really, really good answer to that and how Telecom looks at it, right? So the career kind of asked the same, but uh, maybe this uh, alludes to what you described earlier in terms of, uh, you know, investing in disruptive enough companies or investing in upsides during challenges uh, where you see the risks are. So what is the impact of the current situation possibly? I mean, will it, imp will, will it, will it possibly affect your investment horizon in any of the portfolio companies, right? So I think it's kind of just trying to figure out you know, as you work with the companies you've invested in right now, how, how are you looking at the lay of the land intra and post COVID in terms of, you know, impact on your portfolio? Yeah, uh, so, so, so it does impact. Um, so the question is, does this impact the investment yeah. horizon? 
uh, for, for our portfolio? And the answer is yes. So if you think about how much, how, how long we were looking to invest, um, to hold some of the investments, I think I would, you know, push it out maybe a year longer than what we had anticipated before. Um, just to give to, to give companies and to give economies time to rebound um, and be able to you know meet their growth plans. Mm. I think others will look at that as really great from an entrepreneurial perspective. But you know you're not going to pull an exit early enough. But I think it's also quite intelligent on your side, actually, Komi, that uh, you don't want to sell cheap at that point, right? So you don't want to exit at a lower premium than you would. Uh, exit yeah. in, a, in a much better time. I, I don't know which of the two is, is a key I think, driver. I, I, uh, yeah, I uh, think that we um, we're we're not about the calendar. Mm -hmm. We're about the milestone, right? So there is no hurry. The doctor didn't prescribe to exit in 2025. You know, the entrepreneur shouldn't be watching the calendar. The entrepreneur should be growing the company until it's big enough to make him happy. And, you know, and it's not, the exit process is not something that the company manages. It's a recognition from the environment that value has been created. So I, I think the market will tell the entrepreneur when there's enough value on the table for the entrepreneur and the investors to be happy. So it, 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 you're, you're right, it's not about uh, the timeline is not about we have to exit by year X. It's about let's wait until there's something on the table that is valuable. Excellent. And we have a question from uh, Dublin, um, Ireland, um, from Ife. And if I pronounce it correctly, for, uh, forgive me, Ife or Ife if I did. Um, as a tech startup, would you recommend partnerships and does Tialcom invest in pre seed companies? So, uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's, a, it's unclear how you define partnerships, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, I, if they're good partnerships, we recommend, but I guess if you're talking maybe in terms of um, working with, uh, like if you think, for example, for a B2B service company, uh, then should you work with telcos, for example, should you partner with banks? Uh, if, if it's within that context, it's definitely something to consider in terms, as you think about the, your distribution channel. Uh, partnerships with investors, uh, it also depends on where you are as a, as a business. If, it's a, uh, if you're you know, ready to bring on board investors to partner with, uh, that could also be, you know, depending on the type of business, that's also uh, valuable to have investors who can support you. Uh, with, to build and to, to scale your company. Um, and then I've just spoken more broadly because the partnership was not clearly defined. Uh, and then do we invest in pre-seed companies? So, so we invest, um, I guess we, we're, we invest across the VC value chain. So we've done uh, fairly early stage companies and as late as uh, we did one, one series C investment, but, our, our goal is to, as a strategy, the vast majority of our companies will be Series A companies, but we do play across the, the value chain. So we do some, in our portfolio, we'll have a few seed companies as well as um, a few Series B type of companies. Great. Um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my connection a little bit there. I'm not sure if you, if you answer the part about the pre-seed part, right? So, um, you, you did, right? Yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, so let me pick the next questions here. Um, okay. Um, so Andretta, if you're able to see the next, okay, great. I've got one from Mishu. So a number of companies are off building things, but without a clear understanding of the problem or the user. I don't know, maybe you've seen this in, in some of your rounds of, of discussions you have with entrepreneurs. Now, I don't know if, if, if you do go uh, lend a, a helping hand, right? So how do you help with that? And, you know, will that likely lead to failure? So I think it's just a question of, okay, do you, when, you, when you do encounter some of these entrepreneurs and some of the challenges that you have, um, you know, as you, as you look at, 
you know, the, when you evaluate which companies to invest in, um, what do you do with the ones that maybe you find that are not really ready um, to onboard? Sure. So um, I think uh, Maurizio had um, articulated uh, a bit in the presentation around the criteria we use uh, to to make uh, to make an investment, and it's clear it needs to be and and for us there needs to be clarity around there is a problem. The solution will solve the problem. The team can execute on the solution to solve the problem. Uh, so you need to be able to check that from just you know product market fit perspective. Uh, in a situation where we encounter entrepreneurs, uh, um, where say maybe the, there's no product market fit, uh, what we we try very much to give feedback in terms of you know telling entrepreneurs why we we're passing on an opportunity, uh, because I think it's also part of building the ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. you, you just don't go quiet. You give them feedback, and then also you know within the ecosystem there are you know accelerators. There are incubators. Um, there are other entrepreneurs who are operating in the same space. So where we can, we point them in those directions uh, to see if they can find additional support uh, from 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 such institutions. Got it. And actually, the next question is exactly ties into that. So maybe if you just complete it, uh, Andreas, right? So can you share an investment decision that performed uh, poorly than you expected? This is a question from Ram Sorry Kuti. Um, uh, and what you learned from that investment? Maybe I'll take that because I've mm. made more mistakes than Andrea. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to hear that, Mauricio. <laughs> I think that um, the, uh, if, if we look back, even in the, uh, you know, the Africa Fund has been around for uh, two years and we've made uh, seven or eight investments. Uh, so we have a longer uh, track record outside of Africa before that. So, We've made more, more mistakes for the time being in Europe and Israel than, than in Africa. But very often, the nature of the mistake has been around the timing of the market opportunity. So uh, entrepreneurs are very intense and uh, have a very strong view about the future of a certain space and bet everything they have on that vision. And they can be very compelling. Uh, in their explanation. So I think that the companies that have uh, performed poorly or worse than we were expecting are the companies that were wrong and we were wrong in the timing of the market opportunity. In other words, they were ahead of their time, mm -hmm. but they used all of their cash uh, before the market really opened or was ready for the opportunity. So I think market timing is very, very important, which is why now, you know, we try to make new mistakes, as we say, you know, learning from the past is not that we don't make mistakes, but we try not to make the same mistakes. And so right now in our filter, in our assessment framework, we do have something that um, tries to support a view about the timing of the opportunity. And if a company is too early, we just provide feedback and don't invest and wait for the timing to be correct. So yes, we have made investments in companies that have performed worse than we expected. Mm -hmm. And very often is the anxiety of the entrepreneur and the wrong assessment of the investor to see a change happening faster than it actually does. And in fact, you know, linking to the COVID crisis, COVID is the opposite of that. Mm. COVID is accelerating opportunities that were supposed to happen in the next five years. So I think we must be very ready to change our frameworks depending on the environment. We may be now missing opportunities because we're skeptical about how fast that opportunity can materialize. Uh, and in fact, it could be faster than we think. Got it, excellent. And um, there's a question about, you know, just you know, looking currently and looking back. So from Tunzi, and by the way, we have about four minutes. So uh, do try and put your questions. We'll try and get to them as much as possible. Uh, so Tunzi Nguanyu is asking, you know, how long do you see operationally uh, we'll be able to go back to the financial performance of most companies back to the 2019 uh, levels, right? And to what extent do you think this will vary among sectors? I see you're mostly investing in the tech companies, the tech sector. But how do you see this uh, panning out across the sectors from you know, performance levels return? 
Yeah. yeah, I think this will honestly depend on, um, will differ across sectors. Um, hello? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, brilliant. This will differ across sectors because there are some, some sectors that are seeing an acceleration. Uh, so if you think about online education, for example, or if you think about, you know, FMCG, uh, fresh fruits and vegetable distribution, those are actually seeing an acceleration. Uh, whereas there are some spaces that are that are that are more impacted than others, so it it will it will definitely it also depends on the length of the crisis. So it's a little bit difficult uh, to to name a time because we don't know when this um, when the pandemic will end, um, and then after after which then things can get back to normal. But in my sense, I mean, if you look at previous pandemics. It's probably, you know, 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. Um, uh, the other question is, uh, how long does it normally take uh, to get a response from TL Capital? TL Capital, sorry. Um, after submitting your deck via the email. I think it's just someone just wants to know how long to get a response from you. I'm not sure if it's someone who's tried it before or not, but um, yeah. So, um, it, so it, it depends um, on the, like at what stage. Uh, so if it's just, um, you know, maybe the best way to answer this question is to explain our investment process mm -hmm. uh, just very quickly and high level. So initially what we do is um, we have an interaction, you interact with one of the partners uh, over a call or over a meeting. Uh, and then after that, if we if we decide this is something that fits well in our strategy, then we engage the other partners, uh, probably in another call or another meeting. And then if we move, uh, if we, if we then if we decide, okay, this is something we really want to explore, then we we go deep into business due diligence, which means um, you know speaking to your team, speaking to your customers, uh, your existing investors, understanding the market, so going a little bit deep. So this is something that can take anywhere from, you know, four, three to four or five weeks, uh, depending on availability of people to form an opinion around the market and the company and the team. At which point we make a decision on whether or not we would like to issue a term sheet. Uh, we then, if we decide to go ahead and issue a term sheet, we issue a term sheet and then we have a negotiation, which can go anywhere from one day to, you know, maybe as long as, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, depending on on how the negotiation goes. Uh, after that, then we, we, we launch, you know, legal accounting due diligence is involving third parties to make sure your company exists, you exist, you say who you are, you just check, you know, the boxes around um, the business itself, uh, the finances and the like. Uh, after, then we also do the legal documentation and, um, and then uh, once we're done with that and everything checks out, then we, uh, we make the investment. So end to end, a really fast process, anywhere between two to three months. Excellent. And uh, could be longer depending on the situation. Oh, that's, 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 uh, I, I think that, that's, that's great to hear because typically, you know, I think others have seen a bit high, longer than that. So um, great to have that. And uh, the last question is just before we end. Um, is, is a governance uh, question and how much, you know, levels of freedom you give the entrepreneur. So I wouldn't want to leave this question unanswered. Um, so how do you balance uh, governance rights and giving the entrepreneur ample levels of freedom to execute in your investments? And uh, what is the models of in preserving those long -term, that long-term commitment alignment, especially when already high risks are heightened, especially like now intra COVID and pretty much post COVID. I think uh, Maurizio did allude to this, but maybe you can just elaborate on that. Yeah, uh, I, I think that, you know, the, in general, um, I, I think this is more a question for the entrepreneurs than for us, because we think that we're doing things right, but the entrepreneurs then uh, is the, really the other end of the relationship. But <clears throat> the way we intend to is that uh, we invest a, a significant amount of money and uh, we like to have a possibility to uh, influence uh, some decisions. 
And the decisions are not about the strategy of the company of the team, but is about an ability to uh, support the entrepreneur or to have a say on some items. And there are three items that are really key. One are changes of strategy. We encourage changes of strategy, but we like to agree to them. So it's the entrepreneur that starts the strategy process, but <clears throat> if we invest and we take a board seat, our main protection is to have an ability to um, veto or to support uh, the uh, changes in strategy. The other is changes in the key people. We invest in a team. And if the CEO wants to fire everyone and hire a completely different team, or want, you know, or the, uh, uh, that is something that we'd like to have a say. Uh, again, we encourage changes, but we'd like to be part of them. And then the other dimension is subsequent financing. What is the next round? Uh, the company decides to you know, distribute dividends, to take debt, to do another round. So I think that, again, we are very aware that we are glorified passengers and we're sitting on the back seat and the driver is the entrepreneur. But because we're managing somebody else's money, we want to make sure that we have an ability to ask the entrepreneur to reconsider in when we think that there's a wrong turn into one of these three fundamental elements, the strategy of the company, the C-level team, and uh, the financing um, of the money that comes in after uh, our money. That, that is the main pillars of our governance. And then there's so much as, you know, board seat rights and uh, a liquidation preference and this and that, but those are technicalities. The reality is that we uh, try to align with the entrepreneur and um, we uh, try to be selective in getting in the way. But when we see something that we think is wrong on strategy, uh, C-level, uh, hiring and firing and financing, we try to be relevant in, in those decisions. Thank you, Maurizio. And, um, you know, great way to end uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, with, that, with that note from you in terms of exactly how you do it and, uh, and what sets you apart, especially operating in Africa, uh, this being inside uh, the minds of Africa venture capitalists, you know, very important, uh, at, I'll, I'll say, at this point in time, but especially Africa tech companies that could be looking at investments, or some could be also dealing with some challenges they're having um, with, with investors, but also looking at how do we continue to grow and thrive and ending, of course, with uh, what uh, Andrea told, you know, mentioned before, do not let this crisis go to waste. So how do we not just stay alive, like Joey is saying it, how do we also find a way to thrive during this time? So thank you all for joining and um, looking forward uh, uh, to joining with you on more webinars. And I'll just ask uh, uh, Andrea first and then uh, Maurizio second uh, to just give us their final parting words. Thank you. Andrea, go first. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, I think my parting words are very much linked to, to the presentation uh, I had given in, in terms of the, the winning companies. Uh, so if you're an entrepreneur listening or a business listening, the, the winning companies will be those that will be able to make tough decisions now, uh, you know, conserve cash. And then also the entrepreneurs that are able to to adopt to the changes. So look at the shifts that are happening uh, now uh, and see how to adapt to that um, and, and build a business that can be sustainable. So during this crisis and also post the crisis. Thank yeah, you. My, my, yeah, my parting word is this. We, we um, have the privilege of listening to the story and the worldview of hundreds of entrepreneurs. So we have the privilege of sort of living in the future, right? Because these entrepreneurs have very strong views about what the future can look like. And uh, our message, um, I, I want to say something to the established businesses that are on this call. So uh, we've been to the future and we're back. And what we see is that the future is digital and it's driven by the startups. So do make sure that you have an open mind and an open ear to interact with startups because there's a lot in there 
that can be very, very relevant um, to the survival and the success of the large businesses, particularly not to go, the, you know, let this crisis go to waste. Part of the answers about how to leverage this crisis can be found into the startups. Thank you very much to our esteemed panelists. Thank you to our great audience. Thank you very much. Without you, this will not be, you know, will not be worth it. So thank you so much for joining and for your questions. Amazing. And please stay, stay safe, stay home. And in Ajua's words, stay alive as a business. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.